So we are in different ways talking about uh, um, knowledge, um, how knowledge and uh, influencer is influencing organization and uh, uh, how the structure of uh, the same organization uh, is uh, influencing the very way they works and uh, they work and uh, how being aware of what is uh, happening within uh, uh, a, an organization is influencing uh, itself now uh, i'll ask you uh, and marco to introduce, just introduce yourself quickly uh, before speaking and i'm i'm starting with marco and uh, i'd like as in your experience and you meet a lot of companies continuously uh, how much ready they are I'm, how much do they uh, understand and they feel the need for for all this because it's very interesting i mean it's if we think about uh, how organizations could could evolve if you think about how knowledge should be and decision processes uh, and how software could uh, help us augment what we do it's it's all very interesting and then we look and and of course there is a niche market and small groups aware okay. of this but uh, how do you see if it, boiling back to the Italian everyday life uh, how do you see it okay uh, first of all uh, I apologize for my English but, uh, uh, it's funny that in a, in, a, in a place like this talking about state of the net in Italy I'm the only Italian in this panel and I'm actually working for a Japanese company. So. Well, this is the <laughs> state of the net. It's not the, it's not the state of the net in Italy. But anyway, uh, from my perspective, we, we made a similar discussion four years ago uh, with Iwan also. And, but something has changed, definitely, because uh, uh, a huge amount of people start to, to use thanks to the mobile phone uh, first to the smartphone, so-called smartphone, if uh, somebody thinks that really a phone can be smart. But, uh, uh, the people tend to uh, walk around uh, the barriers that the company made because uh, uh, I, I met uh, some companies that do not allow to use not the social media within the company, but the internet connection. But uh, now, the people doesn't really care because they got their smartphone and so they are in touch with uh, their community, their, their network, their social life. So uh, in, in this sense, uh, uh, I think we can't stop the, uh, the sun uh, the, because uh, it happened anyway. Uh, and this is the good news. The bad news is that uh, uh, something in Italy especially, it's really changing within the large organization or the very small one. Uh, but we have a, a, a huge number of mid-sized companies that culturally refuse the, you know, the, the use of the internet. Well, and this is terrific because they, in fact, they refuse to recognize the, the power of people sharing information and are the same company that uh, uh, do not allow to use the company phone to call your parents if you need it, okay? It's, it's the same mindset, I think. It's a really old style, boring stuff, but this is the thing. So we uh, are, I think in Italy, we are still in a, in a digital divide uh, in terms of culture, company culture. Because uh, the, the question is that uh, from the talks of, of the two speakers, uh, you don't, sometimes you don't find somebody to talk with about this topic within the company. So this is the main issue. And I think we as a community, we, we would have to take care of this to make uh, evangelism, and we try to do that, in fact, as far as you know. So it's a, it's a call to action, I think. Okay, thanks. Uh, and, and please do feel free to 
interrupt him. Um, Ewan, I think that one of the... Uh, I was reading one of the chapters of your books recently, and, and I very much like the idea that you describe of how we continuously learn. We use the web to, to learn, and this is... Uh, we're all most shy using this, uh, this word in some cases because it almost feels like learning is something that needs to be done in a formal way, but otherwise you're sort of wasting your time. Um, while it's, it's fascinating, and, and I do see this in the way I use the web. It's, we, we learn, we change the way we think every day. So how, do you, how would you recommend developing these kind of patterns in side organizations. And I think that it would be, and this is something I'm going to leave, uh, the, the last question I'm going to ask uh, to each one of you is uh, what is the very next thing that uh, all the people working in companies here can do when they go back to work on Monday? It's kind of a simple thing that can sort of, you know, be a step in the right direction. Yep. So you, you can prepare your... Um, <coughs> So, well, introduce yourself quickly and, and then uh, tell me how you see that this can, can be okay. implemented. Um, I'm Ewan Semple. I work with lots of different organizations, mostly large ones, helping them, as Paolo says, understand how to help some of what we're talking about happen more quickly. And uh, in fact, my keynote tomorrow is going to go into this in more detail. But um, I think a lot of it is around having several conversations this morning <clears throat> about the economy and the reactions to the economy and the possibility of doing something about it. And I worry that many of us, <clears throat> particularly in organizations, have been trained to be passive. Excuse me. <clears throat> we've forgotten how to think for ourselves and speak for ourselves. And we've accommodated structures that have made us feel safe, but have actually made us at greater risk. And in fact, Mark was talking about people having sort of access to mobile phones and being able to get access to social platforms. I was working with an insurance company the other day there where I confidently said, well, you can't stop this. And they said, no, we can. We take the phones off our staff. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always a little bit wary of being a, a techno-utopian, as, as Dave sort of described, and just assuming that the technology will necessarily end up with a p positive outcome. Um, which is why I keep banging on about the fact that it's about people and individuals taking responsibility and how they use the tools. And so that was how, why I would slightly disagree with Dave about the thing about Twitter and, and its p potential for change or, or the fact that you can see patterns in Twitter that you think mean something but in fact don't. That's because people are still largely using these tools very passively. They're using Twitter as if it was a broadcast medium, as if you could trust the things you saw on Twitter, even if that is the statistical patterns rather than building their own networks and having their own hooks into the conversations on Twitter, which those of us who've been around on the web for a long time know is how you build in your sense checking. And, and so I think the big thing for me is the need for individuals to step up and take this responsibility. Yeah, th this is a very interesting thing. Yeah, I think uh, I just want to build a bit on the Twitter issue because I think that's important. I mean, I use Twitter extensively. I probably use Twitter now more for searches than I use Google. Because if you build a big Twitter network, you can ask it questions and it will give you answers far more effectively than Google. Yep. I had this, we had a big um, project. We were capturing narratives in Pakistan. I got phoned up at one o'clock in the morning to be told that our website was in high Urdu, not low Urdu. I didn't even know there was a difference. Yeah, the client had signed it off, but I was going to get the blame. And the whole thing was going to go live. You know, at 9 o'clock in that morning, we're having 200 schools go out to capture stories from older generations about what matters in Pakistan, and the whole thing is going to go belly up. Yeah? So I tweeted the request, the problem. Mm -hmm. Within minutes, two people had come on and got their parents in Bangladesh to retranslate it for me. And somebody else had come on and said, look, You've probably got a problem because you're using Microsoft Word, which we were, regrettably. And it's got hidden HTML, so you need to do this in Unicode, otherwise it will mess up the Urdu. <clears throat> and don't worry, I'll do it for you. And we were live at 9 o'clock. Yeah. Now, the whole point about that is because I published to build a network, I had a network which could then help me. Yeah. 
But it well, wasn't by virtue of my status or authority. It was by virtue of my willingness to share. And, and it's, the, it's the principle of reciprocity as well. well the fact I'm, you've helped other people in the past. I'm not, I, I agree and <coughs> I disagree. I don't think it's just reciprocity. I think it, it's more than that. I think it's the anthropological concept of a gift is more powerful than right. the yeah. capitalist concept I'm going to enjoy okay. of, of reciprocity. All right? yeah. Basically, gifting is a fundamental part of humans and Twitter sort of feeds on that. But at the same time, I think what we're now seeing with apps is apps, if you trust the source, effectively act as a mediator which actually reduce the amount of time you have to spend searching. Uh, we're now doing experimental work, if you saw those landscapes, by which if we build those landscapes with a group of experts, we can then send those landscapes out to the web, return data into it. Yeah. So you start to build, I think what we're going to see is much more granular approaches to the web with multiple tools and trust is going to have to become institutional as well as personal for those sort of things to work. And I think that's the really interesting issue, is can you build trust into a, a little bit of software based on its origination? And I actually think you can, no, we do, we, but we're going to move forward on that. But you and it's okay, you've been wrong before, you can be wrong again. Yeah, you know? but you eventually realize <laughs> I'm right. <clears throat> well, I, I, I just got a request to uh, uh, ask him to speak slowly oh, so no. that uh, everybody will understand. I'm Welsh, I can't to, speak yeah. slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say Please. something about the trust problem, as uh, Ewan called me on that? Um, yeah, I, I wish that were the case, because it would simplify a lot of interactions online, certainly. But um, I, I sort of um, react badly when people talk about solving the trust problem. And I think it's not a problem. Trust is a human um, decision. It's a, it's a human thing. It's not a problem, so it doesn't need to be solved. What needs to be solved may be problem of reputation, problem of... Um, authority but not the trust so uh, trust is not a problem we, we learn we trust the way we do based on all sorts of inputs it's better to improve the inputs on which we base our trust uh, or the decision to trust someone but that, that's not that's not that important what, what I was um, what is connected with that is when you said that you shared into a network and that's why you got wonderful response that was helpful. You get a network, you, you deserve. So your authority and status has something to do with that. It's where you start from or who you are that attracts certain people to you and then the sharing. The sharing is to maintain. So sort of dividing between establishing a network and maintaining it, two separate things almost. Um, so that's okay, just but I, I will try and speak slowly, but as I say, I'm Welsh and we speak quickly, all right? So I will, <laughs> I will do my best, all right? You can't build a sustainable company or society based on the capacity of a small number of thought leaders to build trusted networks. Or you can't build a company or a society based on good people doing good things with each other, all right? That's idealism. Absolutely. So the institution is, is how do we create trust in things, which historically we did, for example, through apprentice systems. Right? So apprentice systems create a ritualized trust in knowledge because of the process people have been through. A London taxi driver spends two years driving around the streets of London with a map on a motor scooter yeah, until they know the name of every street. And the exam is to be given two points in London and to describe the route out turn by turn and the route back turn by turn, mentioning every hotel and major landmark. Now, that creates something called the knowledge. It has a 40% pass rate, a minimum period of two years, and this is critical the hypocampus of a London taxi driver is enlarged as a result of the process. So the brain physically changes in the process. Now, one of the, re the side benefits of that is you're pretty unlikely to be raped if you get into a black car, but you have a high probability of being raped if you get into any old taxi that turns up. How is that connected? Well, because the ritual process of joining a profession a collective identity, also introduces moral and ethical aspects. So you say same in army, you can take a thug from the streets, you put them through army training, ritualized training, yes, they may still be thugs, but you can move them into a different type of environment. So I think what we're seeing with some apps, for example, 
is effectively the ritual processes and, pro and the, the knowledge of the process starts to transfer the trust into what I call, and this is the anthropology, an object of material desire, which then actually allows you to propagate on a wider basis. So it's much more complex than oh, the yeah, individual. Uh, absolutely, yeah. most things are. So the, the, what you just described is one of the inputs in, uh, that would help me decide if I trust someone or not, i.e. the, the black uh, cap. Um, but that does not reduce the risk. Sorry, it reduces the risk, but it doesn't remove it. It, it is possible that I get into trouble even with a black cap. Oh, absolutely. It so, also so that's the element I was talking about. But, but nothing, yeah. I mean, that's the other problem. We've got a society which doesn't want to take risks. And a society which doesn't accept failure has got a real problem. Absolutely. Yeah? That's where I'm... That's yeah. totally you, you, were, you were disparaging of computer scientists earlier, um, but you're now claiming that I should put my faith in one of your apps. Um, and I always suggest that people read Larry Lessig's book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, to just alert them to the fact that we're at risk of consigning significant influence to very small groups of people, as you said yourself, many of whom are dysfunctional, that ends up to steer our, our society because we've given up that responsibility to an application. Uh, yes and no, but we always will give up responsibility to applications and groups because it's a matter of economic efficiency. So you can't, I mean, the point is you can't move to a sort of anarchistic state in which everybody takes equal responsibility. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to take responsibility, they want to sit in a flow. So the issue, I think, is how do you build institutions? Well, every, every, uh, let every, me finish. I know, every, everybody confidently nodded at that, that not everybody wants to take responsibility. I think that's partly because we've trained them not to take responsibility. No, it's, uh, well, if so, we've been training them for, for 150,000 years, so it ain't well, going to change much time soon, all right? That's um, I think also we need, and I think the issue is here, all right, you have to move away, and this is a slight difference in your phraseology, it's not trust in an individual, it's how do you have trust in an institution. Right? Because it's not always one-to-one -one type decisions, you've got to make one-to-many type decisions. Yeah. You can trust computer scientists to build consistent apps, you can't trust them to necessarily do the initial design. No. Right? So one of the issues is, I mean I've always used architects and anthropologists to do design rather than computer scientists because they think in a different way, then you look for instantiation. Um, so, but sorry, to come back to the main point on this, you can't move to an idealized society in which everybody has to make individual decisions of trust because that is not sustainable. If you look at it, the economic system of the world, and you know, I don't like the economic system, but it's reality, relies on trust in monetary value and institutions, which is disintegrating all over the so, place. So who do, so so who we, do have we trust? Because that, that begs the question, who develops and launches and provides the apps. You know, do I trust Apple or do I trust my government? And in which case, how do I decide how and why I trust them? Well, part of it is actually the way that I get some of my apps, which is to ask you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So some of the apps, you know, that time we did the Thames Walk, you actually recommended an app and I ended up with half a dozen apps based on what other people had recommended. Yeah. So networks create trust in that sense. Yeah. I mean, there's no need to be absolutist about this sort of okay. stuff. Also, the whole point about apps is you try them and see if they work, then you modify, then you abandon them and you go on to something else. This is what I call a safe to fail experimental environment. The whole point, and this for a corporate point of view, this is key. Because if corporates shift over from buying large systems like SAP, which are a nightmare, um, if anybody's ever tried to pay a small supplier within the first two years of implementing one of those systems, they can't, and move over to much smaller disposable software within resilient architectures, so you can take more experiments, you can have more failure, and failure is actually the way you build trust. It's, it's not by avoiding it, it's by embracing it. There, there may be a false dichotomy somewhere in, in what I'm, um, maybe what I was saying that is, is implied, it's implying a false dichotomy. Not, um, I'm not talking about an, a society or situation without institutions. I'm talking about institutions based on entirely different principles to what we currently have. So the opposite of hierarchy is not uh, a number of individuals just sort of loosely running around. And uh, the false dichotomy that I'm alluding to is uh, lack of hierarchy does not imply, imply lack of order, or not all hierarchies are order. Um, all, all order okay, is not hierarchy. 
But, but this, and is, this is a really important point. So, right? for example, that well, for example, there are not many alternative orders to hierarchy, but one of them, especially online, is power law. That's an order, but it's not a hierarchy. Yeah, but the, the problem is, and I think the issue is trying to move from one idealized model of hierarchy to another one, which is a network. Um, the reality is, if you don't have a hierarchy in an organization, the alpha males will, cre will create one anyway. And, no, that means, and you yeah. don't want that with control. I think you need to balance contradictory mechanisms. So you actually, the network theory works really well for the informal organization, and the informal organization is critical to the success of the formal organization, but it only works because it's fighting the formal organization. Without that tension, it wouldn't form. In the current status quo, yes, I absolutely agree. Um, and, you know, I bow to your expertise in doing that. But what I'm talking about is stepping outside that context into a different meta context, dare I say, ah. and talking about organizations. I cannot myself picture that kind of so, organization yet. So if he says yet. wickedly, you plan to join a commune in a remote rural state no, and I don't, design I, the ideal society. Okay. I'd Let's, rather chew of my right arm than join a commune. <laughs> no, <laughs> that was <laughs> Let's move forward. And, and I'd also like to keep some time to... to, to for a conversation, just quickly, uh, one last round. So, what little practical thing you would recommend our friends here to do when they go back uh, to the office uh, on Monday that will sort of move them in the right direction? Let's start from Marco. Okay. Uh... Well, I think you can put together hierarchy and network. In, in fact, I am, I've been working a lot in telecommunications. So, uh, we are used to manage hierarchical network, in fact. And uh, because we are in a transition, uh, of course, I, I, I'm in conviction that we, we, we really will uh, improve the way of using uh, uh, and creating uh, a sort of... Uh, uh, as Krog uh, always say, tribe of trust, uh, also within the organization, because uh, in in the network we are we are talking of, we are talking of network of people. So, and it works. I give my trust to people uh, much more than organizations so <laughs> work this way, and and so my my only recommendation, my two cents for tomorrow, for everybody. It's uh, uh, starting in, in your job, in your life, start using the networks, uh, listening to the people to connect with and, and trying to answer all, all the inquiries. I, I work in a giant size company and I'm, as, as far as you know, a sort of corporate blogger, let me say. And uh, everybody is supposed to know that within the company. But uh, sometimes happen also to today that some colleague uh, tweeted me or sent me an email and uh, a lot of them are still surprised that I give, a, give an answer to their question. Mm -hmm. So it's an art job. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's very inter interesting even, even in the story that they was telling about asking a question to Twitter followers and getting a response is well A, this work because you have a network of people so it's not just about large numbers, it's about uh, real persons that uh, somehow can understand you. And the kind of investment necessary to build this network is something that uh, everybody, that, yeah. that, that you need to trust. I mean, you need to trust that the network will work and that uh, it will help you, but you need to invest a lot in order to build it. And, and in answer to your question, what people need to, can do, I remember my organization, the BBC, got taken in a very different direction by the Director General at the time, John Burt. And many of us resisted and didn't like the changes he was bringing about, but whinged about it like victims. And I realized that the only reason that he'd been able to do that was that he had talked to enough people with enough influence, often enough, that they just said, yes, let's go in that direction. So if you want to move your organization forward in this direction, you have to start saying it. And instead of just using Twitter to ask questions about software, ask it about moving your organization forward in, in different and, and novel ways. So kind of raise the game and use the platforms 
to have more thoughtful and serious conversations. Um, two, two small things. One is, um, for any change, try to start small, do things under the radar, small projects that can actually happen, that, that, that are not necessarily noticed by um, those who decide about what actually happens. And you can actually get a lot more done that way if you, if you explicitly stay outside processes, obviously respecting the reasons why they're there. You don't want to blow things up. You just want to make um, sure things get done. And second one is more um, conceptual. It's observe how organizations deal with abundance. What does an organization do when there is something um, of which there is sufficient amount, uh, information, connections, and it's very interesting to see where the bottlenecks are and, and what's causing the, some of the problems. But it, to me, the words fascinating, the duality of scarcity, I lack of resources and abundance. So um, I, I would encourage people to observe what happens when there is lots of everything and what happens to it when it becomes, um, when it enters a system of some sort. Okay, and I come from a very firm philosophical tradition which I think is now backed up by the natural science which says you change the system and then people change with it. Uh, you won't change systems by trying to change people and I think that's terribly idealistic and it gives people like Peter Senge and evangelical Christians and they're very similar a great excuse for not doing things because they can just talk about changing people. I would do it if you want one really simple practical thing and this would take 40% out of the cost of the average IT department, is you stop IT departments managing things that they no longer need to manage, <laughs> which is the entire client side of computing. There is no conceivable reason on security or efficiency grounds anymore to determine what computers they use in what environment or the actual collaborative side of any network. You are more secure if you actually unconstrain that side and provide tight constraints on information databases. Absolutely. And I would go and do that because it will create a third, it relaxes constraints without removing them completely and creates a huge fertile area of interaction from which the company will benefit. Yes, thank Standing you. ovation for this. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's, I think <laughs> Mars wants to say something. Well, clearly you can do that on Monday and it'll, you'll be done, right? That won't take much. Um, okay, so I want to ask a question because you hit a button. I want to ask a question. Uh, because you have, this is to Dave, but please, I want everyone else to participate. In your worldview, you brought up the notion of adaptive systems. Yeah. And I've often thought that software, in general, should be an adaptive system. Mm -hmm. And if I am more intelligent and I am comfortable with complex systems, then I should keep Microsoft Windows. But if I am an average person, I should have AOL or some simple kind of in interface. And if I am xenophobic and I am a grandmother, I should have a very simple system. Now, I believed that for a long time, but I've been recently very discouraged with the app economy. You guys have mentioned these nice little apps. Download, get the app. Okay, so they're nice and simple, but what they've done is that they've almost ruined our open web. We cannot access a permalink. We cannot get to the URL of the app. They're oversimplifying things. They've limited things. So I'm at confusion at this point philosophically because I know that software can adapt to the human. See, now you're smiling, see? Because I know you got an answer for me. There's, there's two aspects to this, all right? One is the fact that IT people are going to have to get used to the fact that people want to do what they want to do and they're going to have to work with it. Which is why people like me use Apple because I don't mind having a closed standard because it just bloody well works. And I don't want to have to develop software for bloody Androids because it costs you five times as much because there's no bloody control on it. Even right? though they're an evil company and you don't I, mind no, that. I don't mind. I, I, okay. I, I, I have the privilege of having had a book thrown at me by Steve Jobs and I still buy <laughs> Apple, right? I mean, I know I'm in a very large number of groups now, but I'm still one of them, right? Right. 
The second thing, which is more important, I actually think you're right. Software needs to be a complex adaptive system. In fact, I'm teaching this in Copenhagen in a couple of weeks' time because we were doing a lot of work with the Agile community. So you'll find the Agile and the Scrum community have adopted my Canavian framework extensively. You want to repeat that slower because I so barely understood the you. The Agile so and the Scrum community. Do we all, do we all know what that is? So Agile is a movement for fast adaptive creation, all right? So it's, it's, it's got the right idea, but it's practice ill-informed by theory. So they've got things they know that work, but they don't understand why they work, so they're not scaling, and they're not getting traction with senior executives. So we've been doing some work on this. If you actually take software properly, first of all, you stop building applications, you build resilient architectures with software objects which interoperate within those architects. So then called a URL, maybe? No, not necessarily. So applications emerge from the interaction of those objects and you allow apps to spin off from that because they're stable aspects that work for people and you've got to live with the fact that they're not going to be open and people want to be messy. The second thing you do yeah, is having created that type of environment, yeah, you actually start to change the way you do software procurement. So to give you an example, we now put remote devices with apps on them into an organization so that users just capture a story any time they find something which doesn't work or they get frustrated. Then we look for cluster patterns in those stories and we develop software objects to match those patterns. So we no longer have user requirement specifications and systems analysts and highly static approaches. We move into continuous development, but that means building a software architecture which is resilient, which is object orientated and which can adapt very quickly. And you the IT departments have got to stop these cyclical procurement cycles, which are a good way of justifying their costs, but a very bad way of satisfying user requirements. Capisco. Mille grazie, signore. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? See, I understand. <laughs> okay, are there Excuse any me. other comments, questions, ideas that you want to share? I'm going to start asking questions to the, to the, to the public Paolo. if they don't. I was, I was just at risk of, you shouldn't be encouraging me. Um, <laughs> I've learned over the years that the confidence with which Dave contradicts himself doesn't necessarily mean that he's not contradicting himself. Um, <laughs> again, you're, 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 you're sort of swinging between denigrating the individualism and, and, and organic growth and saying that people won't take responsibility, that there has to be a system and that, uh, and that you change the system rather than expect the people to, to change it. Um, but you're also saying that you need somebody to decide this systematized um, world that you're expecting the software to operate in. So I don't think it's a million miles away from, in fact, one of the chapters in my book was based on, on your idea that if the internet hangs on its back to Mark's thing about the URL and the hyperlink, if this amazing complex edifice hangs together because of such a simple but consistently adhered to idea, then can't we apply similarly? And it may be the system you're talking about, simple rigidly adhered to ideas that allow us to then operate more organically. I mean, yeah, the, the, the danger is, sorry, this is personal, right? But <laughs> Ewan comes from a Scottish Calvinist background. <laughs> which, which I've shrugged off. And I'm a Welsh <laughs> Catholic, all right? So, you know, there's a difference on this, right? <laughs> One of the issues is we need to start to work in a world where actually things which apparently contradict each other are seen as dialectical rather than dichotomies. So actually you need control and you need lack of control, you need interaction between the two, yeah. you need stabilities, but there are times in human systems when you have to say no. All right? So the role is to create something where, you, so for example, my earlier idea, I would have a very simple system which says you can do whatever you want on social computing, but anything which is company confidential has to be a hot link to a database. Yeah? So the first time you put real data in, we'll give you a warning. The second time we'll give you a final warning and the third time we'll fire you. Right. 
So you create a really simple system with a simple rule that human beings can maintain, yeah. then it's sustainable. Yeah. You don't get the IT department to do everything they can possibly do to allow, you know, so that human beings will never fail. You put responsibility. So it's a even, matter of dialectical Even if they don't want to take it. But yeah. in this, I, <clears throat> just a second, in all this <clears throat> fighting I IT, or, at some point I think we, we were arguing that uh, we should start an Occupy IT mo movement to, to <laughs> find freedom from, from IT departments. <clears throat> and HR too. And H well, th that's the <laughs> next to say to Well, the, the two pillars <clears throat> of fighting against innovation, IT and the HR department. Can we really think of, because let's forget large organization for, for, for a second. Uh, in Italy, our econ economy has a very small number of very large organization and has a huge number of medium and small companies. And I think that in some ways they are sort of, they're not even fighting IT. I mean, they are just fighting computers. It's, it's uh, I think that we were discussing this, the, with all the success that uh, uh, iPads have with managers and people is that they finally have a computer that works. I mean, the real new thing is not that you can, you, it, it, the real new thing is it, it works all the time. It doesn't crash. You don't get blue screen and you have full control and you can easily install new stuff on it. And it's amazing. amazing. It's, it's different. So, how would you this, all, of course, also connect with the wide availability of uh, so-called cloud-based uh, applications or apps uh, on, the, on the iPhone. How do, would you recommend uh, people working in small companies to go about uh, and find uh, uh, simple products or simple solution, what kind of software, uh, I mean, whether it's blogging or wikis or conversation or using, t or using Twitter internally, to really make a difference not so much in a you know from a theoretical point of view but from a very practical you know we we you use blogging internally and it'll, how it's going to well, change just by stopping trying to emulate big organizations mm. i think they all look at the big organizations who have their microsoft and their sharepoint and and jive and tibber and all these big and sap they actually have a greater strength in those big organizations. I'm, I'm struggling all the time to tell the big corporates not to go down that homogenous, mm. centralized path, but to have an ecology, to borrow one of Dave's things, a, a, an ecology of smaller tools. The small to medium enterprises are already configured, or they're already set up for that. Um, how to find it is another question, but I think having the confidence to not be like the big corporates is the, is the thing. I mean, SharePoint is a corporate disaster anyway. <laughs> I mean, SharePoint is to knowledge flow what Six Sigma is to innovation. Because it's an attempt to create a lowest common denominator universal approach rather than a constrained, fragmented approach. Yeah? So I think small companies are in a very good position. Um, I mean, I run a small company now. I don't think we've ever bought any software to run our business because we can do everything and we experiment with some things, they fail, we put something else in place. Safe to fail experiment, and I mean safe to fail experimentation, is a more successful research strategy than evaluation. And big companies are gonna switch into that direction. There's an interesting sideline on this for Italy. I mean, Italy really isn't one country, much as I love Verdi and the whole sort of movement. Fundamentally, Italy is four or five different countries just as the UK is four countries, Germany is eight countries, France is eight or nine. If you actually look at it, cultural cohesion is key. So countries which are under five million in population have cultural cohesion. When they go over five million, they become less cohesive. Yeah? So my vision on Europe is actually smaller countries within a framework. But the same is true for large companies. So I think large companies are gonna move, this fits in with what you were saying, is you've got loosely coupled and tightly coupled networks which can permeate into smaller companies and customers. And the secret of smaller companies is to create a network model. It's almost like an object model with polymorphism and input output, yeah? Um, that basically allows them to network quickly so they can join yeah. together with things and separate. And interesting, some of the original studies on this were done in Northern Italy, um, looking at garment workers around Milan. 
because they both cooperate and they compete simultaneously. So they've got both models in continuous play with a high degree of institutionalized trust which has evolved over four or five hundred years. And it's that actually evolution of the position which allows it to happen which is there. So starting to manage yourself on an interfaceable network becomes a way that small companies can actually use other companies to become bigger but dissolve and reconnect as they go over time. It, it all depends on what kind of network it is. As I try to say, to me, it's the distributed network that is magical, not, not any kind of other network. So loosely joined hierarchies into a network or networks within hierarchies are not what I'm talking about. I, I'm very happy that they exist. I'm very happy for people to, to, to do something about them, but that's not what I'm interested in. What I'm talking about is following an, an organization that already exists, which is the internet, TCPIP. It's not about lack of control. It's about um, resources re arranged differently, control of whatever sort, but it's, it's autonomy. It's autonomy at the node level. And the connections happen from that. I often have people talking about, well, but if everybody's autonomous, what about the social aspect of it? And I'm thinking, well, isn't it better for the social to emerge from strong individuals than have some sort of forced, organized, complex uh, imposition of a system on them and then pretend that it's social? But it's, it's not an either or. A, a nodal network. Of course it's a, not. A nodal network but can actually. We don't have an alternative. Yeah, we do. A nodal network can flow over and through larger, more traditionally organized structures. And, it's, yeah, and that sort of complexity can handle. You don't have to switch it completely, and it won't happen anyway. Because you can't move. The present has to evolve from where it is. You, know, you can't suddenly design a future state and jump there. We'll evolve from where we are. So nodal networks, as opposed to distributed networks, allow you to accommodate current organizations and modify it over time. Well, the internet didn't really try to accommodate the publishing, the media, or any of the established organizations or institutional rituals. That's uh, the point. Yeah, the internet bypassed it. I hate it. to tell you this, but they're now modifying the internet and structuring oh, the internet and in the way it works. I and totally that's agree. What and that is why I'm going back to the internet. Mm. Because yeah. the web, I totally agree with you, the web has done that. But the internet itself hasn't, re as reality, far as I can tell. Reality catches up, and you work with reality, not with the ideal. Well, the reality 300 years ago was pretty bleak. And it's very different from today. Can I say something? So, not for sure. Adri uh, hello, hello. Adriana, so the thing is that you're talking about the net and TCP IP. Speak but slowly. The, but the <laughs> reality of the web today is that we are dominated by major platforms. Totally, okay? that's my point. And the little guy, the medium-sized guy, gets niente, okay? Think I, okay? Now, I'm eating a sandwich. Think I'm eating a sandwich, and the crumbs are falling on the table, and this is all the money I get. The little crumbs that Facebook and Google and Microsoft leave for us. Mm -hmm. So as I've thought about distributed architectures for many years, it seems to me that only through having two-way communication, two-way APIs, open standards to allow the small and medium-sized people to participate in the economies, that's the only way we will have a level playing field. Yeah. Yeah, but I'll give you some hope, all right? I remember when I joined IBM, and I didn't join IBM. I was conscripted. Yeah? They bought the company I worked for. <laughs> and I found people who still believed that sooner or later the world would realize that microcomputers were a waste of time and they would go back to mainframes. Yeah? And IBM then became at that time almost the world's largest ever loss and completely lost its domination of the IT industry. The same is going to happen to Google, the same is going to happen to Facebook, and it will happen within the next decade. Because a dominant predator for any period becomes so confident in their position that they don't see the changes happening. So if you look at what's happening to Google, most of us now have a Google alternative on our web page, which allows us to search without Google telling us what we want to find. But if you don't know this, get two people from the different political background to do the same search, they'll be given different data. And Google don't get this because they recruit people who think like the founders of Google, so they become entrained. And the cycle time in the IMT industry is 15 or 20 years before things break or change. 
Microsoft the same way. They'll probably become a gaming company over the next 10 to 15 years because they never had a decent operating system in the first place. All right? It was just a card index system. Yeah, and, and never so, so but how do you, since you're a fanboy, how do you see Apple? Because to me, they're the, they're the worst evil devil company there is. I think the only people who think Apple are evil are IT people who want open standards rather than users. I think Apple are creating an ecology which they will not be able to fully control. And I think what you'll start to see is different patterns of control emerging within the Apple ecology which they won't be able to sustain. And I would really, all right, go and read some basic evolutionary biology, particularly dominant predator theory, and actually start to build on that because human systems and IT systems work the same way. You know, if, if you read Jim Collins' Good to Great, all right, that, that book, it's a terrible book because it basically says all these companies have been successful for a long period of time. They all did these things, so if you do them, you'll be successful. You look at it as an evolutionary biologist. He picked the first player in a market in each case. Now, this is dominant predator theory, where in ecology forms, the first predator in the market, the rest of the ecology organizes around them. And it's not until the ecology is disrupted that the thing changes. But the predator becomes overconfident, so when the ecology does change, they can't adapt. Now, that is what is happening to IT at the moment, and we're about to go through a major flux and new things will emerge from that that we can't forecast. So stay agile, work within the ecologies of the dominant things, but stay flexible on the outside and wait and see what happens. <clears throat> One more question. Thank you. Yeah, no, in fact, the, the funny thing that, that occurred to me when I, when I got Speak to meet slowly. Robert <laughs> Cajot, uh, the Berners-Lee's partner at the, at the CERN, it, uh, was that the first thing he told me is, wow, I, I don't like Wikipedia. And I was like, huh? I mean, you invented the web, right? So why, you shouldn't. It's a closed system. We wanted to a, a more open web. So now people is going to, this was probably four or five years ago. The people is going to, are, are, are going to Wikipedia. So that's not the web, which is honestly, uh, Let's say, make me think that uh, yeah, people is basic. Well, obviously, Steve Jobs was a freak, was a, was a was a control freak. That's not the point. But still, people want to get something that simply works uh, wonderfully, and they are, are not so interested in openness, in the profound. And uh, uh, obviously, I totally respect it, and I, I'm a part of it in a certain sense. Uh, geeky way we think about openness, but. Mm. Just on my little percent. Is there a question? Oh, question? oh yes. Uh, if we have a lunch. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right we are question. getting there. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your for this panel. And uh, there are some uh, instruction on the lunch. Yeah. Well, you should applaud it.